Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Meet the Expert event. I'm Corey Kitchen. I'm a board member with the Buena Vista Natural History Museum. And today we're going to be here with Amber Stokes. Um, she's going to be speaking to us about the process of adaptation in an ever-changing world. Uh, Amber is currently an associate professor in the biology department at California State University, Bakersfield. She grew up here in Bakersfield um, from age seven and attended CSUB as an undergraduate, earning her BS in biology. She then earned her master's and PhD from Utah State University, studying newts and their toxins under Dr. Edmund D. Brody Jr. After completing her degrees, she started at CSUB as an assistant professor in the biology department. She currently does research in addition to teaching physiology, ecology, and zoology courses. Some interesting facts about Amber is that uh, she is a chemical ecologist working to better understand the rough skinned newt and its adaptations that help protect it from predators. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know that if you like today's event and you'd like to see more content like this from the Buena Vista Museum, I would invite you all to consider making a donation to the museum. We are a nonprofit. You can make a donation to the museum anytime on the website, which is buenavistamuseum.org slash donate. Also, um, if you would be so kind as to make sure you keep your devices muted, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, type them into the chat window. There's a chat button on your screen that you can access, so you can just click there and, and type your questions. Uh, at the end of the event, there also will be a Q&A, and you can probably take yourselves off mute at that time and ask any questions that you have. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Amber Stokes. All right, thank you so much for having me again. I did a talk in, I think, November or September or something, sometime in the fall um, of this year. So I wanted to do something a little bit different from what I did last time, which was really a much more heavy um, research-based uh, presentation. And so this time I wanted to give a presentation that does tie in my research, but is kind of a broader theme um, to kind of educate um, people about adaptations. Um, as the world is changing and the climate is changing, adaptations are going to be more and more uh, necessary for organisms to be able to survive um, in that changing environment. So um, what is an adaptation? So we can kind of have a whole bunch of different types of uh, definitions for what an adaptation is or isn't. Um, but the basic definition, and this is just from Merriam-Webster dictionary, is that it's a modification of an organism or its parts that makes it more fit for existence under the uh, conditions of its environment. So it's just making an organism um, better able to withstand the various, uh, you know, different constraints and different challenges within its particular environment. So I want to go over just some, a couple of really quick examples um, of adaptations. Um, and things that I think you may or may not be familiar with um, in its entirety. So um, we, of course, have examples of polar bears. Polar bears are um, in the news a lot these days because their habitats are changing so dramatically. And their fur, of course, is white, and this serves a variety of purposes. So one main thing for the polar bear is that it helps them to camouflage themselves in the snow so that their prey can't see them coming. But in a cold environment, white fur is not necessarily the best color to have because it reflects solar radiation. And so the polar bears have come up with or have adapted to their environment by uh, developing a really interesting characteristic. So first of all, this is the 
this is their fur kind of pulled aside and oops and we can see that they actually have black skin underneath all of that fur and if you looked really closely at their fur it's not actually white um, instead it's actually kind of clear and it's hollow in the center so this is um, a microscope image of the fur um, like the hair shaft so ours if we looked at ours it's solid but with a polar bear it is hollow on the inside and so it kind of works like fiber optic uh, cables do and the sun shines down on the polar bear and the photons of light actually sorry keep hitting that the photons of light actually uh, flow through the shaft of the hair and they are absorbed by the skin. So that helps the polar bear to stay warm. So they're able to kind of do both things at the same time and camouflage themselves, but also um, be warmed by the sun. So the next organism is an elephant and elephants have these giant ears, of course. Um, and I think most people just kind of think of ears as like, oh, they're for hearing, of course. But um, the giant ear flaps of elephants have an added advantage for them. So their ear flaps actually have a lot of blood vessels within them and they're kind of thin um, skin. So they're not really thick tissue, they're relatively thin. And so in the heat, which most elephants live in environments that are relatively hot. Um, and so in the heat, those vessels in their ears actually vasodilate. So they expand and that allows more blood to be shunted to the surface of the ear and they can actually um, evaporate um, or sorry, radiate heat away from their bodies. So they can actually cool their body temperature um, through this process. Uh, humans, of course, we do this as well. Um, so especially if you have pale skin like I do, um, <laughs> you will turn red when you get really hot. And that's usually because there's blood vessels in your face that are going to vasodilate and that's helping you to radiate heat away from your body, um, allowing your core body temperature to actually decrease. So um, over here on the side, you can see that there's a bunch of different temperatures. So they've looked at the different parts of the ear and numbered all of them, all of these different kind of um, ridges along the ear and then measured the actual temperature. So some of these like bigger flaps are actually really fairly cool in temperature. These that are closer to the head of the elephant are warmer in temperature. And that's primarily because blood is actually flowing from the core of the elephant into the ears. And so it hasn't had time yet to cool down. So that's a really important adaptation for an animal that lives in a really hot environment. So kind of a classic example of adaptations and something that we teach in most um, biology courses is the peppered moth. So peppered moths um, were primarily located in um, London, I believe, and they come in two morphs. So they have this morph, which is where the name comes from, right? So they look kind of light and then have these black spots that look like pepper. And then they also have a melanistic form, which is this black moth over here. And what they found was that during the Industrial Revolution, um, there was a lot of pollution being released. And this was kind of worldwide, but um, in Europe in particular. And so before 1950, they had a higher number of these light moths. And then after 1950, they had dark, uh, uh, sorry, before 1950, they had a higher number of light moths versus dark moths. And then during the Industrial Revolution, 
um, we see that kind of flip. So we see that there are fewer light moths and more dark moths. And so one thing, one kind of pattern that they were seeing is this was what was happening in the cities, but in the forest, it was kind of the opposite. So they would have high numbers of light moths in the forest and low numbers of dark moths in the cities. And so another observation was just that the trees in the city were getting coated with soot. And so <clears throat> they had these really, really black trunks of their trees, whereas the trees in the forest, they were not exposed to as much pollution. And so they weren't getting as um, dark on the trunks of the trees, and they tended to have lichen and other things growing on the trunk of the tree. And so researchers started to kind of question, like, why, why would this happen? What is actually going on? And they hypothesized that the reason was to was in response to predation, that peppered moths, the light version of the peppered moth, actually did better in the forests because they matched those lighter trees. So predators can't see them as well. And they hypothesized that the melanistic form did better in the cities because they matched the black um, trunks of the trees that were black due to pollution. So again, predators couldn't see them as well. So they did a lot of trials, um, observational trials, actually going out and releasing moths and then counting how many they could um, recollect from the different areas. But ultimately what they found was that, yeah, these changes were to allow these moths to camouflage themselves and to match their environment. So um, the picture got kind of blown up so it doesn't look as clear, but you can see this is one of the darker trees that would be located in the city. And the peppered, light peppered moth really stands out. You can see it very easily. The dark peppered moth blends in much, much better, right? And so a predator like a bird is going to see this light peppered moth really, really well and catch it fairly easily. Over here, this is one of those lichen colored trees in the forest. Right here, this one blends in really well. Right here is that light um, version of the peppered moth on that tree and you can barely even see it. And then this is the dark peppered moth on the tree. So. In the cities, we have an increase in the number of the dark forms because uh, of predation, right? Because they're able to actually um, blend in with their environment. And then birds and other predators target the light moths because they're easier to find. Whereas in the forest, we have the opposite happening. So there's an increase in the number of the light pepper moths in the forest and a decrease in the number of the dark peppered moths because they're easy to spot. So I wanna talk a little bit about the process of how adaptations form. And the reality of adaptations is that this is really just the process of natural selection, which I know there's many of you here that already kind of know that, but there's three major components for adaptations to form. So the first one is variation. The second is heritability. And then lastly, we have differential reproduction. So I'm gonna go into all three of those to help you understand better. So variation is of course having kind of slight differences in traits between different individuals. So this particular population of caterpillars here has no variation uh, in terms of color, right? So they're all green, they're all the same. Whereas if we look at this population of caterpillars, they have quite a bit of variation. So we have three different color morphs of these caterpillars. <clears throat> The second trait that's important, um, or the, the second thing that is important for adaptations to occur is heritability. So the trait that we're looking at in the case of these caterpillars, we're talking about color. Um, and so that trait has to be genetic, 
right? So you have to be able to show that maybe a blue and a yellow caterpillar have incomplete dominance for those of you who are into genetics and they produce a green caterpillar, right? They kind of blend together to produce this green caterpillar. This is not a realistic example, but you get my point. So they're showing that there's heritability, right? That these particular traits are actually coming together and consistently forming um, a trait outcome from the, the reproduction of two individuals with two particular traits. <clears throat> And then lastly, we have differential reproduction. And so differential reproduction says that some individuals will be more successful in their environments based on their traits. So some individuals will have traits that make them better fit within their particular environment, that make them better able to withstand whatever types of challenges there are within the environment. So they will survive longer and produce more offspring. And those offspring, because the trait that we're talking about is heritable, those offspring will then also have whatever that beneficial trait was. So if we look at this population, but we think about them in, I don't know why that doesn't wanna work. We think about them in grass, now we can see that a predator is going to have a really easy time finding some of these caterpillars and a much harder time finding others. So in the green grass, these green caterpillars blend in fairly easily, but the blue and the yellow really stand out. And so the green caterpillars will likely be eaten less often by this bird than the yellow or blue caterpillars. And so in the next generation, we will have more of the green caterpillars and fewer of the blue and yellow caterpillars. And so we see a decrease over time of the blue and yellow caterpillars over and over until eventually all of the caterpillars in that particular population could all be green, in which case the bird now has to adapt, right? So the bird either has to just find a new food source or has to adapt and have maybe a change in their visual perception or a change in the way that they're actually detecting the caterpillars in order to um, better take advantage of them as a food source. Okay, so now I'm going to get into my research a little bit and again, kind of talk about it in the context of um, adaptations in particular. So my research system really involves um, two main organisms. We have the newt over here and we have the garter snake over here. Um, just a couple of quick points about the newt. The newt are amphibians. So they're a type of salamander. Um, they are amphibians. They're not lizards. Um, I'm very sensitive about that. Um, they're amphibians and not lizards. So they're, you know, maybe about that long um, total length, including their tail. Um, and just like a frog or any other amphibian or most other amphibians, they are terrestrial throughout much of the year, but then they reproduce in water. So they will mate and then deposit eggs. And when the eggs hatch out, larvae emerge. And those larvae look a lot like tadpoles, a little bit different, but they do look a lot like tadpoles. So we have the newt, this is the prey, and then we have the garter snake, this is the predator. All right, so I wanna kind of break down what their individual traits are and how that is related to adaptation as a whole. So newts have the neurotoxin tetrodotoxin. Um, Tetrodotoxin is a very, very powerful toxin. It is more um, toxic than cyanide and several other kind of major chemicals that we think of as being very toxic. 
And it's found in a wide variety of organisms. So kind of more commonly known, we have pufferfish. So pufferfish have tetrodotoxin and uh, people actually eat pufferfish in the form of sashimi called fugu. Um, and so it has to be prepared in a really specific way, which means you have to have a very well-trained sushi chef um, to help you uh, not get sick um, from eating the puffer fish. So here in the US, there are only a, a pretty small handful of restaurants that serve fugu because it could be um, potentially life-threatening. Um, and then over here, we have the blue ringed octopus. Uh, so the blue rings on the octopus kind of come out more brightly um, when the octopus is upset. Um, so we'll talk more about this coloration, this type of warning coloration a little bit later in the talk. Um, but these octopuses are, uh, they're really cute. They're relatively small. They're off the coast of Australia. Um, people often get hurt by them because they're cute and small and they find them and want to play with them. Um, but they actually are venomous. So um, they will stab you with their beak and inject TTX into you. So they're pretty dangerous. So just, you know, it's a warning just in general, unless you know for sure what an animal is, probably don't want to touch it. Um, and so this is kind of a, a quick and dirty <laughs> phylogenetic tree. And it's showing all of the different groups of organisms where tetrodotoxin has been found, just to give kind of a quick idea of how many different types of organisms actually have this toxin. So we have, of course, ray finned fish with our puffer fish over here. There are different types of echinoderms. So these are starfish and their relatives. Uh, red calcareous algae has been found to have tetrodotoxin. There are some types of dinoflagellates and also bacteria that have the toxin. Um, down here, we have a whole host of primarily marine species, although there are a couple species of flatworms um, that have tetrodotoxin, but we have um, a bunch of marine snails and clams and those types of things that have the toxin. Also some crabs. And then in our terrestrial species, it's a couple species of flatworms. And then we have salamanders and frogs. So there's multiple species of salamanders that are all in the same family that have uh, the toxin. And then a bunch of different types of frogs as well. So really quickly before we move on, it's important to have a good understanding of what tetrodotoxin does. So if you're actually familiar with the structure and how neurons work, I'm simplifying this immensely. So, <laughs> but this is a kind of cartoony version of what a neuron looks like. Um, this is the cell body up here, and this dark spot is the nucleus. These little arms reaching out here are what we call dendrites, and they're these like finger-like projections that are taking information from maybe a receptor or from another neuron, right? So they're giving, they're pulling in information from other cells within the body. And then they transmit that information down this long portion, which is called an axon. And then these little ends over here are the axon terminals. And the axon terminals are then going to disperse that information to other cells. So this is a really important system because it's how our body gets all of the information, right? It's the way it, it is the cause for how you can see you know, someone kicked a soccer ball across the playground and you know to duck, right? Your body responds to that stimulus through nerves communicating with one another. So very important. So your neurons have these signals, which are really just very low voltage electrical signals. And they're traveling down this axon and being passed on to other cells. So if you're exposed, 
to tetrodotoxin, what it does is it actually binds to specific channels within the axon of that neuron, and it blocks those signals. So now your neurons are no longer functioning, right? So you will suffer paralysis. And in the case of most vertebrates, um, that paralysis also affects your diaphragm. And so your diaphragm is really important because it moves up and down when you breathe. So if you take a deep breath in, you feel your stomach move out. And part of in during that process, your diaphragm moves down and that allows really for space for air to enter into your lungs. So tetrodotoxin stops your diaphragm from moving, which means that you can't breathe, right? Um, the heart actually has resistant sodium channels, so your heart keeps beating, um, but your skeletal muscles, so you can't move and you can't breathe. And so death is due to asphyxiation. So when people are exposed to tetrodotoxin, they can put you on a ventilator if they know that that's what's happened. Um, it, it's activated pretty quickly, though, so you have to make sure that somebody knows what has happened to you. Um, and so they can put you on a ventilator and eventually most people recover, um, but you do have to be on a ventilator. And so again, most organisms that come into contact with tetrodotoxin actually die. So my um, PhD advisor has a paper from 1968 where he exposed many, many different types of animals to tetrodotoxin tetrodotoxin and found that nearly all of them were susceptible and would die after exposure. All right, so I have like a very, very quick video though that kind of demonstrates um, how newts, like how this toxin actually protects newts from predators. Oops, maybe it's not gonna work. Naturally, it uh, worked when I was practicing, but I'll describe what, <laughs> what the video should show. And um, you can just Google this and look it up on YouTube or some other platform. It's National Geographic, and it's a really good, like, I don't know, I think it's like three minutes or something, a really uh, good short video. But basically what part of this video shows is a newt um, encountering a bullfrog and the bullfrog consumes the newt and then the bullfrog dies um, due to exposure to the toxin and because it died relatively quickly the newt actually is able to escape out of the frog's mouth so <laughs> the frogs you know bullfrogs will swallow newts and other things whole they don't obviously they don't chew them up so um, a newt could actually survive in the stomach for a short period of time and then escape predation so that's one thing all right so within the system within the newts in particular we can show that having tetrodotoxin is an adaptation. So we've shown through a lot of research that there is variation in this trait. So newts actually have different levels of TTX. There are some newts, even within one population, you can have some newts that have very, very high levels of TTX, and then some newts that have no levels or no TTX, right? And so we have one population in particular where um, we have measured newts with zero milligrams of TTX, and then the most toxic newt that we've ever measured has 28 milligrams of TTX, and that's enough to kill up to 56 humans. So it's a lot of toxin. We've also shown through research that um, this particular trait is highly heritable. So um, we've done this mostly with female newts and measured their TTX levels and then measure the TTX levels of their offspring. And we found that the mother newts 
um, with high levels of TTX also produce baby newts that have high levels of TTX. And then we've shown some differential reproduction. So as was seen in that video, and those types of observations have been um, seen in, in real life many times, um, newts can survive encounters with predators. I've also done some research looking at um, how juvenile newts can survive encounters with predators in water. So even the little newt larvae can escape predators just because they have high levels of TTX. So newts with higher levels of TTX are less likely to be eaten by predators and more likely to survive, which means they pass on those high TTX genes to the next generation. So garter snakes, their trait is that they have resistance to TTX. So they are actually able in some areas of the country, they are able to consume these toxic newts and have very few ill effects. So what happens with these garter snakes is that they actually have genetic changes to the particular channels that are in their neurons. So those channels that TTX typically binds to have some changes. And so with a resistant snake, we have, you know, our neurons firing, and then they eat a newt, and the TTX just kind of bounces off. It can't bind to those channels, and so their neurons continue to fire normally, and they don't suffer paralysis. Now, I want to be clear that they are resistant, not immune. So they do still have some binding of TTX, but it's at much lower levels. And so um, they will slow down, right? So there is kind of a cost associated with eating a newt and that a snake will often be moving more slowly afterwards um, than it was beforehand. So um, we've seen in nature and these, most of these pictures are just pictures that I found on Google that people had taken while they were out and about uh, in the world. And so most of them are actual real life pictures of snakes eating newts in the wild. And so these snakes that are resistant, they have this food source that not many other animals are consuming. Right, so most of the newts are being eaten by these snakes that are highly resistant. And so again, with the snakes, we've been able to show that the resistance is also an adaptation. So again, there's variation. Um, there is variation in how resistant they are. Um, they'll have different changes to those genes uh, and that will make them either very, very highly resistant or not resistant at all. The most resistant snake is estimated to be able to um, consume uh, basically like 900 newts ultimately, <laughs> which is, you know, no snake is going to eat that much. They can handle um, so much TTX that they can pretty much eat any newt that they would like. Heritability, it's been shown that, again, mothers that are highly resistant produce offspring that are also highly resistant and vice versa. So a non-resistant mother would produce offspring that are non-resistant. And then with differential reproduction, we kind of have preliminary evidence on this. And this suggests that, resist, that snakes with resistance are able to produce um, more offspring by utilizing newts as a food source. So they're actually obtaining newts, eating them, surviving that encounter. And then, and, and so they just have an additional food source to provide them with energy. There's an added benefit though. So these snakes after, oops, sorry. My mouse is going crazy. So these snakes, after they consume these newts, they will actually sequester some of that toxin. So sequestering toxin 
basically just means that they store some of that toxin in a certain organ somewhere within their body. And so these snakes have been shown to sequester tetrodotoxin in their livers. And so that sounds a little bit odd, but if you think about how snakes are eaten by their own predators, those scales on the outside are not good to eat. They're kind of hard to get through. And so a lot of snake predators are birds and they will basically kind of eviscerate the snake and eat the internal organs, which really is where all the nutrition of a snake would be located. And so <clears throat> birds will learn that the snakes have toxic livers and kind of stop feeding on them. And so it benefits the snake in multiple ways. So within this system, we've been studying these predators and prey in the context of this kind of arms race between the two species. So basically we have these newts, they're adapting to their predator, right? They're adapting to the presence of that predator by producing TTX. And as the newt population becomes more toxic, that then causes the snake population to adapt to the prey by becoming more resistant. Then that resistance, again, puts pressure on the newt to become more toxic. That then puts pressure on the snake to become more resistant. So we kind of have this circular pattern happening where they're kind of pushing back and forth on one another with these particular traits. This of course has costs, otherwise it could Potentially, like hypothetically, it could go on forever, but there are costs to this. So, for example, um, garter snakes that are super, super resistant are slower just in general than a snake that is not resistant at all. Um, and so they it does affect their muscle physiology and how well their muscles are able to operate. Um, not enough that it didn't develop but enough that it could actually be harmful to them, right? If they're slower, they're going to be more likely to be caught by their own predators. So we see this kind of circular relationship happening between them. But we've also seen that it's not just these two traits of the toxin and the resistance. They actually have some other adaptations to help them um, in this arms race. And so one of the things that we have um, shown is that they have different behaviors that kind of will help them to um, deter predation by each other, but also from other species. And so one thing has to do with aposematism. So aposematism is a really fancy word for warning coloration. So we all in this audience, every one of you, I'm sure, knows that if you see something that is black and yellow, that you should probably steer clear of it because there's a good chance it will sting you, right? That black and yellow pattern is warning coloration, it's aposematism, and it is indicating to humans, but also other organisms, that that organism is dangerous and you should leave it alone. We see aposematism in all sorts of organisms. So again, we have a bee here, but we have a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies are using this same technique with these um, highly contrasting colors, right? So it doesn't have to be yellow and black, orange and black, different colors, as long as they're highly contrasting. You have to remember that not all animals actually see color. Um, birds see color really well, but then there's a lot of other animals that can't see color, but they can see hues, right? So they can see contrast in color and recognize patterns. And so monarch butterflies have these really bright um, orange and black wings. Monarch butterflies are also poisonous. They feed on milkweed and they sequester toxins from the milkweed plant. And it, there are pictures and lots of documentation of birds 
feeding on monarch butterflies and then throwing up. So <laughs> it doesn't kill them, but you know, nobody likes to throw up after eating. So, um, and then we have snakes. So a lot of venomous snakes, right? So we have kind of two things happening. We have poisonous animals like the butterfly, poisonous animals, they have to be consumed in order for you to be exposed to the poison. So monarch butterflies aren't going to hurt you in any way. You might not like it if you ate one, right? But we're probably not going to eat one. Um, and then venomous snakes though, venomous animals have some mechanism of actually kind of injecting the toxin into your body. So we have snakes, but also this bee is venomous, right? When it stings you, Bees also have a toxin um, that some people are highly allergic to. For some people, it's just kind of irritating. Um, but in both cases, they are venomous. So this venomous snake also has warning coloration with these really bright banding patterns, right? So we have the <clears throat> red, um, black, and kind of yellowish color um, that are banded. So they're very... Um, lots of contrast in the colors, a clear pattern, again, indicating danger. So the newt kind of has aposomatic coloration as well. You'll note that its back is just brown. So they're kind of cryptic with their back, meaning that they can camouflage with leaves or in the dirt and they're kind of hard to spot. But if they think they're in danger, they do this behavior, which is called an unkin reflex, where they kind of do sort of a backwards back bend, um, and that helps them to display their bright yellow or orange bellies. So the underside is shown, and snakes and other animals can actually see the contrast in that coloration. So this can deter some animals from attacking this newt. Another thing that we found is that snakes, um, garter snakes in particular, can assess their own resistance. So they do this through tongue flicking. So uh, snakes, of course, have these forked tongues, which I think most people are familiar with. There are lots of kind of myths and um, older stories that that is about snakes being evil in some way. That is not the case. The forked tongue actually allows them to essentially smell the air, right? They stick their tongues out into the air and that allows them to pick up chemicals just like our nose does, right? Chemicals floating in the air. Um, and so it's kind of an additional sense of smell for the snake and it's highly sensitive and it's forked so that they have two sides. So then the same way that we have two eyes that allow us to kind of see peripheral, peripherally in two different directions, snakes have these forked tongues that allow them to detect chemicals coming from different directions. So they can actually tell pretty precisely where a scent is coming from. We have the same thing with our nose, right? Two nostrils that helps us kind of determine directionality of the nearest, you know, burger joint or whatever we're looking for. Um, I don't think this video is going to work again. Nope. So this is kind of the first half of this video. And what it shows is a newt walking along and a snake actually approaches the newt. And it kind of tongue flicks at the newt. And then the newt goes into that unkin reflex and the snake goes along on its way. Um, and so there's kind of two things happening there. The snake can tongue flick the newt and determine that that newt is actually too toxic for it to eat. And it'll just sort of bail without even trying to consume it. Or the snake can see that unkin behavior and decide it's not worth the risk. So again, we haven't quite measured these behaviors in terms of this arms race between the snakes and the newts. Um, but it's highly likely that even those traits are 
um, being kind of counter adapted by each other, right? So the snakes, that tongue flicking behavior could be influencing either TTX levels or the unkin behavior in the new. So we could see that these two be these two traits are also kind of co-evolving with one another. And so one of the things that I kind of wanted to drive home with this particular presentation is that adaptations are everywhere. Every single organism on earth has some adaptation, right? Something that maybe developed a long, long time ago that helps them survive. We as humans, we're a little bit weird, but we have lots of really good adaptations that help us. One of those, my favorite perhaps, is the thumb, <laughs> right? Thumbs are really handy. It allows us to grab things. Nowadays, we text with them. That's not what they originally evolved for, but we can do it. Um, so <laughs> we have a lot of adaptations as well that help us survive and do better in our environments. But it's really important to remember that the world is changing, right? Climate change is happening. And we have a lot of things happening that haven't happened, at least in the recent history of the world. So here in California, we have lots and lots of really extreme wildfires. And this really impacts a lot of different organisms. It can really impact, obviously, plants, but also it pushes um, deer and other animals into places they might not want to live or typically live. We also have a lot of drought, right? This is another issue with California. We're very dry to begin with, but now we're going through these very long drought cycles. So then, for example, this year, we got quite a lot of rain and snow, and that caused mudslides and all sorts of problems, right? Problems for us as humans, but these are problems for animals and plants and all of the organisms that live within a particular ecosystem. And then we are also having warming. So um, a lot of the major, really big ice sheets that are in the ocean are starting to melt. Um, this has a number of potential consequences. So as those big giant blocks and sheets of ice um, melt, they start to desalinate the water. So the ocean can become less saline, right? Less, um, have less salt concentration within it, which can affect all sorts of animals. The ocean's also getting warmer. So um, if we think about, um, Fishermen, like on the East Coast, a lot of fishermen on the East Coast are now having to travel longer distances up towards the kind of more northern latitudes of where they normally fish because fish are actually physically moving because the water temperature has changed so much. So um, we as humans have to adapt, but all of the organisms have to adapt. And sometimes it's easy, like in the case of those fish, they just behaviorally start moving towards warmer, or sorry, towards cooler waters. But sometimes it requires a lot more um, time for adaptations to form. So all organisms have adapted, but they might need to develop more adaptations and different adaptations as the climate continues to change. And we can talk about these adaptations in lots of different ways. I study it with my research, which is not necessarily directly related to climate change, but it's also something that we have to be aware with, aware of, is that as the world and the climate are changing, all of these organisms have to try to keep up with that. So with that, I want to thank um, all of these lovely people. I've had so many students help me um, with my research over the years and they've all been great and are doing awesome things. Um, and then I've gotten quite a few sources of funding, um, a lot of them local, like uh, Chevron has funded research for me quite a few times. Um, and so I appreciate them. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for coming. 
Thank you, Amber, for that amazing presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, we had a few uh, attendees join a little bit late. And so uh, just for a little housekeeping, I'd like to invite you all, if you have a question, to you can uh, put it in the chat, uh, just type it in the chat box and I can read it to Amber. Or um, if you can um, take yourself off mute, um, you can ask your question directly. Okay, we, one have, the we have one question here, Amber. Uh, one question was, we had talked about earlier in the presentation about African elephants adaptation with their ears to help cool them. Um, the question is, Indian elephants also live in a hot temperature, not as quite as probably as hot. How come they don't have that adaptation or do they, but to a lesser degree? They do. Um, probably equivalently, I would say. I don't study elephants, obviously, so I couldn't tell you if it's exactly <laughs> the same, um, to the same degree, but there's actually a lot of animals that do it. I just provided one, um, particular example, but jackrabbits, jackrabbits have those big giant ears and they use them also to help cool. Um, so a lot of animals that have these kind of giant ears, um, kit foxes, I would guess um, or hypothesize maybe that their ears also do that because they have those really big ears. So um, a lot of animals that live in the desert have or very hot environments have mechanisms of um, dissipating heat just like that. Wonderful. We have another question. Um, this is about newts. Um, what kind of newts live in Kern County or in our area? And um, are those newts that you study specifically? Oh, that's a good question. So we have newts that are in the um, canyon headed up to Lake Isabella. So if you took 178 headed to Lake Isabella, and basically at that point where it kind of turns into an actual freeway as opposed to like a really scary two two lane road. Um, there's the kind of old highway goes off to the right hand side and um, not too far up that road is a trailhead for Mill Creek Trail. And if you just hiked, I don't know, it's maybe a couple of miles up the trailhead, not it's not too far. Um, the creek actually crosses the trail and there's newts there. So that species, those are Sierra newts. I've mostly studied um, what are called rough skin newts, but the ones nearby are Sierra newts. Um, and so they're very closely related. I have done some research with them, but not from this particular population. Um, they also have quite a bit of toxin um, in them as well. And actually, that's the population that got me interested in studying newts in the first place. So um, that was, um, so yeah, we have newts nearby, and um, but I haven't done a lot of work with these newts that are local. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, are any of the newts that you study and uh, endangered species? Some of the um, Calif uh, yeah, the California newts, um, particularly the ones that are in kind of the higher elevation locations, they're not fully endangered, but they're species of concern, um, which means that in certain populations, their numbers are much lower than what we would like to see. And so in those populations, I am not allowed to collect from those locations because they're trying to protect them and help their populations increase. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I don't show any other questions. We'll give it uh, another minute if anybody wants to uh, type or come off mute. If you have any um, questions. I think uh, Dr. Seek has her class watching while they're in lab. 
but then most of the rest of the people are actually my family. So <laughs> they're probably very familiar with your newts. Okay. Yeah. Well, with that, um, I would like to thank you for your time today and for sharing your amazing knowledge with us. Um, the museum would love to have you uh, back again soon. And before we go, I would just like to mention again that if you enjoyed today's event, um, we do have many Meet the Expert events available on all different kinds of topics. Um, and please uh, visit our website to learn more about those events while you're there please feel free to consider making a donation to the Buena Vista Natural History Museum or becoming a member. Your ger generosity is what makes events like this possible. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. Keep an eye on our website for the next Meet the Expert event and others like this. Thanks again and have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.